Uh, he's an animal lover. Um, he's um, been wanting to be a scientist since he was three years old. And so this is not just um, a job. This is a passion and a lifelong uh, pursuit uh, for Dr. Moriano. Um, he's been working with GRF or GRCA for 25 years. And a lot of you don't know that long history. And it goes back to the very beginnings of GRF. Um, he started out with a study in lymphoma that was uh, partnered with some other breeds uh, back in, well, I guess that would have been 98. Um, and as, as science um, progresses, there's always more questions. And um, I mean, when you think of the progress of cancer research, we have to go back um, to 74, Nixon, 73, President Nixon declared a war on cancer, mm -hmm. and we're still in the fight. There's been a lot of progress, but when you think about the pace of science, that's 50 years already in human medicine, and um, survive, treatments are much better, prevention is much better, um, so it's a process that we have to expect to go at a pace. Um, so uh, Dr. Moriano's research in this area start, um, began with lymphoma, uh, progressed to um, the MAGIC project in, I think it was notes, uh, 2002 or? MAGIC was about 2008. Eight, okay. Yeah. Um, that was making advanced uh, discoveries in golden cancers or something of that nature. And there was a Magic One funded with Morris Animal Foundation, a Magic Two founded with Canine Health Foundation, um, funded with Canine Health Foundation. Um, uh, that moved into uh, Shine On, which is uh, been, it's about in its eighth year with the manual sarcoma, and that will be uh, a large part of today's presentation. Um, uh, also underway currently is COLIN, which is canine muscle sarcoma early detection. Uh, okay. And even though osteosarcoma isn't one of our most major cancers, it does affect 5% of goldens. Many other breeds uh, have more, and we view this as a team effort, a team effort with all of you, with Morris, with Pan Health Foundation, and with other breed folks. So uh, in service to other breed folks, we sometimes partner with cancers that are not our most
uh, GRC National. So some of you might have seen the, the dog or the pony before, I'm not sure. Uh, but, but this is really different. And I, I do want to pick up on something that Rhonda said, where she said, uh, 50 years of cancer research in humans, it actually goes much further than that, right? 50 years of, of really dedicated investment. And it is true that we have a lot more treatments that we know how to use for humans and that the outcomes are, are really starting to change. And we're very proud of that. And I, I work at a NCI designated comprehensive cancer center. Um, and I'm, I love being part of seeing what's happening to us collectively as a society and how we are um, starting to uh, bridge holes in, in that uh, wall against uh, cancer. But I do think that when it comes to prevention, um, it is the same black box in humans and citizen dogs. So uh, if you smoke, quit. Uh, if you don't use sunscreen, do. And everything else that you hear, I will paraphrase the experts, we have no idea if it works. So diet, supplements, we, we know that if you're lean and healthy, you are less likely to get cancer. But all the other stuff that's sitting on the GNC shelf, all the stuff that's being advertised on the internet, uh, whether you eat Twinkies or cruciferous vegetables, we have no idea if it works. And this comes straight from the mouths of the experts, right? So our dogs don't smoke willingly, so we don't have to tell them to stop smoking. And most of them have hair coats that protect them from the sun. So with the exception of a few rare tumors in naked bellies or naked dogs, that technology is not in the Right now, for the intellectual property. That makes the prevention of dogs is really, really hard. hard. Um, we are yeah, the preventative medicine company that's licensed them for uh, veterinary applications. So, and I think the story that I want to tell you today started um, about so 2015 ish, um, maybe a little bit earlier. And I got a call, and uh, on the other side of the telephone, I heard somebody say, um, Commander Circle Rust sucks. We all know that. And um, we, we would like to ask you if you can do something transformational that's going to change the path of our breed with Hamanja Circle. And we don't want more, we don't want more of the same. So you guys did magic in the genomics and blah, 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 and it's great, but we want something bold and crazy. And I said, well, you know, it, it just turns out that the timing is right because we've got a test and we've got a treatment, and if we could combine those two things, maybe we could find the cancer before it happened, and we could kill the tumor before it happened. And uh, I said, they're never gonna buy it. And they said, we love it, do it. And I'm like, no crap, now we have to do it. <laughs> Easy to talk and talk, right? So I'm gonna walk you through um, um, the better part of an eight year project in 40 minutes. Um, and, and hopefully you'll get a sense of the fact that it's, it's not easy. Um, you need to be smart and you need to be dedicated and you need to be good. And you need to be more than just a little. Um, but I think we're really in a, in a great path. And I wanna say that we have a poster child here today. So say hi, Journey. So, and I want you all to see Journey because if, if Journey decides that it's hot and obnoxious and she wants to leave. I want to make sure you all see um, Journey. And I'll tell you more about Journey at the end of the presentation. So are we doing a picture? Yes. Okay, we're doing Journey. Journey. <laughs> 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 so, uh, I just wanted to make sure you know because if Journey decides that it's time to leave, I will take it. And the same goes for you. If anybody needs to leave, please. Uh, please so, uh, I, I am currently at the University of Minnesota, like Rhonda said, it's been a long journey. I, um, I trained at Penn, did my residency at Colorado State. Uh, postdoc at uh, National Jewish in Denver, then spent, started my academic career as a grown up in Texas, was there for four years. Um, Texas in my rearview mirror um, as soon as I could, and no offense to all of you who are, you know, Texans in the moment. Uh, 
it's a great place to, to do my work, and I spent a lot of time there as a child, so I do have fun memories. I moved back to Colorado, I uh, was at the University of Colorado for a decade, and they called me from Minnesota, and they said, what would it take you to move? And I said, you could never get me to leave Colorado. And I said, what will it take you to move? And I said, no, no, come to my life. <laughs> and then they talked to my wife, and she said, oh, I think we should go. So, I, you know, so we've been in Minnesota now for 17 years. Um, the university uh, uh, pays their lawyers well, so I have to do uh, disclosures. And, and the one that is important is that um, I am a founder in um, Companion Biosciences, which is a stealth company right now. Uh, it was formerly known as Canon Biotechnology, and, and, and Companion is right now holds the uh, intellectual property or the licensing for the test. Um, the, the preventative, there's a company that's licensed it for uh, veterinary applications, and Companion holds the license for all human applications. So, um, and, and then the university has a conflict of interest program and policy, and so I meet with them. Um, usually yearly, but sometimes quarterly, if things change, and they make sure that we don't get ourselves in trouble. So, I also have to tell you that I'm going to talk about um, uh as a, a part of a strategic prevention uh, process. And, and EVAT is not yet approved, so it's going through the approval process. So uh, it's not approved and it's not yet So today we're going to talk about Shine On. Um, and in order for you to really get a sense for what Shine On is and why we're doing what we're doing, I need to tell you a little bit more about why cancer happens. And we're going to talk about cancer early detection and risk assessment. And this is really not new. Um, the first indication that you could do early detection of cancer was about 1874 with a discovery of uh, circulating tumor cells. And uh, I, I am old, but I was not born in 1874. <laughs> so it, it's, it's been a while. Um, I'm going, I'm going, so even when you hear about this new thing, it's, it's all a matter of marketing. I'm going to tell you about something that we call actionability. So if you do a test, and then you get a result, what do you do about it? So that's going to be a really important part. And then I'm going to tell you about our strategy for prevention and then the next steps. What are we doing now? What are we doing? So um, we have a vision. And um, when I was at the University of Colorado, we had a, a really powerful vision that was that we wanted, we, we saw a world without cancer. And it's, that's a really powerful statement. But I'm a biologist, and I understand biology and DNA. And as long as we are organic creatures made out of DNA, there is no such thing as a world without cancer. Cancer will happen simply because DNA is a reactive chemical. And I'll touch on that a little bit. So I, I, I thought very long and hard, and, and our team worked on this together, and we, we thought about what is it that we can do that would be cancer. And when we, when we thought about our own experiences with our families and our dogs and our clients, we asked, what is the first and the strongest emotion that people have when they hear that there's a cancer diagnosis? Fear. Yeah, there's anxiety, there's fear, there's anger, there's all of these things, right? Um, and we, we decided that that's, those are negative feelings. Those don't help. And we thought that through research and education and improvement and development, we could create a world where cancer exists, but it is not fearful. So we created this vision, or we came up with this vision, that we want to create a world where we no longer fear cancer. We don't care that it's there. Few of us, I mean, we get colds and we're not worried about it, right? So this, this is kind of where we want to go. So at the end of the next, 45 minutes or hour. I'd like you to, to remember just four things. It's going to be a lot of stuff, but I want you to remember. Um, what, what we cleverly call the SOS test, shine on suspicion, um, and detect the presence of an undiagnosed cancer or the potential that a dog is at elevated risk to develop cancer, maybe as far out as four years before the tumor is in okay. So, and imagine that that would translate that we might be able to do that in a few months, 15 or 20 years before it comes. Um, 
Um, the Shinon approach is unique because once we detect that presence or possibility of cancer, we have a direct <coughs> solution. We have something that you can do besides work. Um, the LIRA project, which I'll tell you about at the very end, seeks to develop a test for early detection and risk assessment that will be equally reliable or better than the SOS test, but more accessible. By more accessible, what do I mean? It'll be easier for, for owners, vets, dogs, and it'll be, we hope, less expensive. And, and I, you know, if you ask me how much the test costs right now, it's not commercial, so I can sort of tell you what it costs us to run. But then you'd have to, like, multiple exit, right, to what it would cost for a person. But we think that um, the technology that we're developing for Lyra will actually be and finally, that um, cancer is intimately tied to aging. So I work on childhood cancers. I know that cancer happens in children. I know that cancer happens in puppies. The youngest dog that I ever diagnosed with an angiosarcoma was nine weeks old. Oh. Weeks, weeks, okay. So, so yes, it happens, but that's, that's one, right? I, I cannot count the number of 10, 11, and 12 year old dogs that I've diagnosed with. So cancer and aging go hand in hand. And we really need to think about if we are going to solve the problem of cancer, um, are we helping that individual? Are we keeping that, that individual alive just so that they go on to live another year with pain and cognitive dysfunction? Or a terminal renal disease? Or, uh, you know, so, so we really have to, to put these things together and think of graceful aging. Um, and, and for whatever testimonials are worth, uh, maybe you can talk to Jeremy's family uh, and, and uh, um, they can tell you a little bit about what, what they think about our uh, goal to develop the prevention strategy in a way that not only reduces cancer risk, but potentially actually creates a more useful environment, reduces biological. So Shine On, the Shine On Suspicious Test, uses a patented platform, and it detects the environment that is favorable for the development of cancer. So it, it's not only picking up that there are bad cells there, we, we think we can find those cells that are there, but we're actually finding that the, the, the home that the cells built to live in, or the, the home that the cells are, are building on, or even more importantly, maybe we can find the blueprint that the cells made to build the home that they want to live in. Um, and, and that's very different from actually finding DNA that came from a mutant cell. And then we have a solution that modifies this risk environment and reduces cancer. Okay. So, what what is your immediate reaction? Your immediate reaction is uh -huh. really? <laughs> you gotta be kidding, <laughs> right? How many of you thought? How, how many of you thought? Yeah, that, that, yeah, a few people that like you, you get it. Okay, we'll see if I can actually show you that we are very close. Not so when we run the SOS test, at the end of a, 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 a fairly involved process, we um, assign dogs to either a low risk category or a high risk category. And dogs that are assigned to the, um, to the low risk category have a very small probability of developing cancer over a one year period. Somewhere between six and 15 months. So we're seeing one. And so by 15 months, the probability of cancer in, in these dogs, and this is based on an N of about 100. Okay, so we, we don't have 1,000, we have about 100. Uh, and it was less than 5%. And on the other hand, the adult dogs that are sent to the high risk category have more than seven times that risk. So after about a year, the dogs that were selected in the high risk category have about a 20% risk and about 50% of the dogs under four years of development of cancer. And remember, we started testing dogs as young as six, but some of them were older. Um, and I'll show you some data that says that we, we are not only measuring age, although we might be measuring it. Okay. So if Shine On is so great, like, why aren't you selling it, right? In real. So, um, getting to the market is a top priority. Um, and the major challenges that we have encountered, the first was, was COVID, so we actually had good financing online in February of 2020. And you all know what happened. So, financing died. Um, 
that was actually not necessarily a bad thing because it allowed us to do uh, some really, really big reassessment. Um, and, and to look not only at the um, opportunities to do business development, but not, not only at the concept of business development and how we were doing this, because we were learning as we went, but also to think about other opportunities that would be uh, open for us to do things a little bit different. Um, and there is, of course, the maturation of science. We've learned a lot more since 2020. Um, and there are some ethical questions that are really, really hard to answer about putting a test and a prevention like this on the market. And, and it's not that we're struggling with it. It's not a struggle to actually know that we want to put it out there. It's a question of how do we frame the educational component so that we don't like it. Because that would all obviously be a breach of ethics. So we want to be very transparent. So we're going to go to the next part. And, and I, I, when I talk about this risk environment, I think it's really important to give you a premise of why cancer happens. And so many of you probably have a concept that cancer happens because you know people smoke or because they're exposed to things or because there's mutations in DNA, and and all those are partially correct. Um, but there actually are a lot of other things about what cancer, how cancer happens. So first we define cancer. Cancer is not one disease. It's it's sort of a group of several hundred diseases where the common thing is that you have cells that divide up. So. Not one thing, many um, All cancers are diseases of genes. So it's not a genetic disease in the context that it's passed to parent, from parent to offspring. There are syndromes in humans that we recognize make up about 5% of the total cancer burden in the human population, where there is uh, one of about 40 gene defects in that family, and those gene defects increase the probability of cancer by a lot. But that's really only a tiny function. So generally, we don't think of cancers as, as heritable diseases, as other things that are transmitted through single genes like here. Um, they are diseases of mutations that happen after um, birth in somatics. Um, and many mutations that alter key functions that the cells use need to happen, and you need to create an environment that allows the cancer to develop. So um, the risk of mutation is, is inherent to all life based on DNA. So DNA encodes a blueprint of life, right? You, you all know that. Uh, how many of you have done 23 and a, a lot of you. So, okay, so you understand. DNA is, is a blueprint of life. Um, but DNA is also a reactive chemical. I can take DNA into the lab, and I can do all sorts things with it to say they say deoxyribonucleic acid. And because it's an acid, it means it's got a little H plus hanging out or a few H pluses hanging out. And those H pluses love to pair up with little minus things that have minuses in them. And they do chemical reactions and they do chemical things. And when they do chemical things, they change their structure and conformation. And that's you know, essentially how mutations And by the way, there is now uh, uh, the, the, the talk that we did a couple years ago um, that has all of this stuff is on YouTube, and if you want to So, cancer is also associated with what we call an age and environment. And we have to separate chronological age, how many years we have physically been on the planet, from biological age, which is the wear and tear that we have, right? So, you guys all know the, the person or the dog that is old in years, but, you know, acts like a puppy, and the person that uh, is, you know, 20, but looks like they could be next to the grave. Well, that's the difference between chronological age and biological age. In biological aging, reduces our, the cancer protective mechanisms that we were born with, and allows the malignant cells to, to essentially develop into this condition that we call cancer. Um, for, for all of you that are taking pictures, I don't mind. It's perfectly cool for you to take pictures, but um, I should have said the uh, um, presentation is being recorded, thanks to Kathy Mandau, so it will be available probably on YouTube. It'll be on the foundation website. On the foundation website. Okay, great. Thank you. And, and you are hearing me, right? Yes. Okay, so uh, for those of you that like science, we published this paper about a year and a half ago. Um, and this paper talks about um, how we have increased 
our own, per, uh, our own risk of cancer as a, as a species, but also the risk of cancer in our dogs, by living beyond the age that nature intended. So if you think of 40 million years of evolution, or 10 million years of evolution for humans and for dogs, evolving now independently in their own niches, um, we lived, our ancestors lived, about 35 to 40 years until the Industrial Revolution. And dogs lived about four years, on average, uh, up until the time that we decided to bring them into our lives. Now, that doesn't mean that there were not 80-year-old humans and 10-year-old dogs. There were, but, but they were few and far between. Okay? Most of huge, uh, huge prenatal mortality, huge infant mortality, uh, you know, young men were sent out to, to war and they died, and women died in childbirth. So there's a lot of things that, that accounted for it, but essentially we did not really, we were not built to live more than 40 years, and dogs were not built to live more than four. Now we live 80, and dogs live 12. And so um, I, I, I used to say this, if anybody works for a car company, please don't think this is an insult because things have changed. But back in the 80s, when I used to drive a, a tiny little Ford, um, my tiny little Ford did great for about 50,000 miles. But then the, the warranty ran out. <laughs> and you know what happens when the warranty runs out, right? At 50,001 miles, the wheels start falling off. <laughs> um, and um, uh, my friend who drove a Honda could drive that Honda for 400,000 miles. So my Ford was a human or a dog, and the Honda was a bowhead whale, right? And the bowhead whale lives for 200 years, and they evolved to live 200 years, and their cancer protective mechanisms work for 200 years. So if we could actually keep a bowhead whale in our home as our pet, and have it live 800 years, 30% of those bowhead whales would probably die of cancer, just like our dogs. So that is the context here, is living beyond the, uh, that, that length of time that nature intended really increases your risk of cancer. And so how do you illustrate that? Well, this, these are human data, and this is from um, the National Cancer Institute Surveillance and Epidemiology uh, data set. And what they've done here is they've looked at cancers from 2007 to 2011 in U.S. SEER sites. And they have basically said how many cases of cancer occur in age. So in the other 20 age group, you know, there's, you can count them, right? But they're small. Uh, in the 20 to 30 age group, they're still small. In the 35 to 44 age group, they're still small. And guess what happens in this 35 to 44 age group? That is our evolutionarily adapted one. And you cross this boundary, and it's not quite flipping a switch, but things change. And very rapidly, as you increase human age, you see that there's a much bigger cancer burden. Okay? So what happens in dogs? So you see essentially the same type of curve. Right? Um, and, and I love these data come from UC Davis. Um, and one of the things that I love the most about this paper is that this paper was written using exactly the same data that was published to say how spaying and neutering was associated with uh, cancer risk in dogs, and this was a big cohort of dogs and Labradors. And, and so uh, Michael and his crew actually took exactly the same data, and they corrected for age. And the risk of spaying and neutering went away, because it was all associated with the spayed and neutered dogs living three years long. So why do they live three years longer? We don't know. But in fact, they did. And all the risk of spaying and neutering associated with cancer was accumulated in that extra three years ago. Okay? But I love the data because it also shows us that when you look at dogs, you also have this curve where there's very, very little um, cancer occurring in this um, time period. But um, as dogs cross their evolutionarily adapted lifespan, you start getting this increase. And it looks just like the humans, but it's adapted to the dog's lifespan. So when people say, well, what about cancer that happens in nine-week-old puppies? Well, that's these guys right here. Yeah, we, we see it. It's there. But it is not the vast majority. And so in humans, these guys are 
um, the ones that come from predisposed families, right? So they're syndromic or they're just bad, you know, S bad. And in dogs, because we don't recognize any cancer syndromes in dogs, these guys are just as bad luck. And these are the guys that are attributable in large part to aging, exposure, mutations, all those sort of things that cause cancer. So um, my friend James DeGregory used this to illustrate the importance of this environment in cancer. And so what they've done is that this is a complicated curve, and I'm going to walk you through. But the bottom line is that cancer needs this environment to cause cancer. So if you look at um, this graph on the x-axis, on the horizontal axis, we have birth to old age, okay? And on the y-axis, we have a relative scale from zero to old age. And, and when you ask how or when do mutations happen in an organism? So mutations happen in, a, in an organism pretty much during the time when there is the most cell division. And there is the most cell division during development and shortly after so you accumulate mutations very, very rapidly, and you continue to accumulate them over your lifespan, but that reduces as you get less proliferation. When you ask, when are stem cells dividing the most? So there's a theory that basically says that cancer is proportional to stem cell division. And it turns out that stem cells, again, divide very rapidly um, during development and in young age, but they, their proliferation rate drops very rapidly, and you can see that as this is dropping precipitously, mutation rate is, is, increased, is increasing, but then as soon as these guys get to a baseline, this sort of, sort of stabilizes. Um, and then you look at this, this magic aging concept, right? So different for every species, but this essentially is your evolutionarily determined lifespan, and this is borrowed time. And what you can see is that as you get to borrowed time, you get a decline in fitness, and that's when your cancer incidence increases. Yep. So the question is, how do we define what the hell this means? Okay, and we're gonna get <laughs> So how do tumors shape their environment? So we think the first thing that happens is that there's a mutation or a group of mutations that give a cell a proliferative advantage to initiate cancer, okay? And that's this um, cell right here. So this guy now has an advantage and it starts making more of its <coughs> and they populate this environment. Uh, and if the environment is unfavorable, it's going to stop. But if the environment is favorable, they're going to recruit uh, blood vessels. Blood vessels bring in oxygen. They recruit um, fat cells because they like to eat. So they're, you know, these are their Twinkies. Uh, and they're bringing a lot of them. Uh, and then they bring in inflammatory cells. And the inflammatory cells create an environment that regular normal cells hate and the tumor cells love. They also repel the rest of the immune system um, and then they change the background of the environment. All the proteins and all the stuff that makes the matrix gets changed. And the tumor has now built a home where it can live safely and happily. It's got a moat, it's got, you know, archers on the, on the ramparts, it's got hot oil for the invaders, uh, and it's happily growing, and then it can do bad things like the pests. Um, but remember, the cancer cells are only one player, right? There's all the other guys in there. And so, when we are thinking of doing early detection and risk assessment, um, the goal is to find an existing undiagnosed or early stage cancer. Or when we do risk assessment, we want to find this environment. We want to find the environment that is being created that allows the cells, the cancer cells, to thrive. Okay? And the cancer cells may be infinitesimally in, in number. They might be a really small number. We might not be able to find them, but we can find the environment that they're building. So. What are the ethical and the practical considerations of early cancer detection? So if we detect cancer early, we need to be able to do something about it, right? I mean, you, uh, we're veterinarians and you guys are dogs. So you bring your dog to me because I decided that I'm bored and I want to go, you know, moonlight in a park. And I say, hey, I've got this test for early detection. And uh, you say, oh, that sounds really interesting. Let's run it, right? And I charge you $1,000 to run the test, and then um, you come back and I say, hey, guess what? Your dog's going to get cancer. And you go, holy. Uh, what do you mean? You know, my dog's perfectly healthy. He's like, oh, yeah, but your dog's going to get, get cancer. And you go, like, where? I go, I don't know. Where? Well, I don't know. What are we going to do about it? 
about it. Nothing, but have a nice day. <laughs> Not cool, right? So, so we need to be thinking about if we're going to give you that, that news, what is it? Okay. So, um, tests that detect the presence of early cancers when we can find them. So they think of things like uh, colonoscopies. Uh, hello, all of those of you of my age. Uh, mammography, uh, right? So if you actually find the tumor, there is a concept which may or may not be right, but we, it, it's a concept nonetheless, that if you find the tumor early before it does bad things and you treat it, you are going to be more successful. And, and that may be true. There, we have some evidence that cancers are born to do what they're going to do. And that when cancers are born bad, it doesn't really matter when you find them, they're going to be bad. And when cancers are born not so bad, they're not going to be so bad, and maybe you're doing more harm by treating them, but we don't. Right? So right now, the, the NCI says early cancer detection improves treatment, we're going to go. So, um, and, and I think the data from, from mammography and, and outcomes could be interpreted as well. Um, but, but if we detect cancer risk without knowledge of time, location, etc., um, you know, we, we need to be able to do something. So, when we think about these tests, the tests should have acceptable specificity. That means that we should have very few false positives. If, if it's true, it should be true. It should also have acceptable sensitivity. If it's there, we need to be able to find it. Okay? Um, it should have high precision. So if I run the test today and I run the test tomorrow, I should get the same answer. Um, and, and finally, and importantly, the test should be actionable. That means there should be a practical solution that can address what the test is telling you. So we're going to talk about the test for early detection in the market, and then I'm going to tell you what we're measuring and how we're doing. So the volition, the volition new Q test, maybe your vets call it the IDEX new Q because IDEX has become the middle person. They offer it, but it's it's not an IDEX test. It's a volition test. Okay. So the pros, um, it's accurate and reliable methodology. The test is phenomenally good at doing what it's supposed to do. Now, listen to what I'm saying. The test is phenomenally good at doing what it's supposed to do. Okay. Um, and that is, it's, it's using an ELISA, oops. It's using an ELISA test to measure uh, little units um, of protein with DNA wrapped around them that's called mucus. Okay. And it's really inexpensive. I think the cost to the veterinarian is um, less than three dollars. So you guys are probably not paying more than that. <laughs> so I, I haven't run it myself with my dogs, so I don't know, but it's, it's, it's inexpensive. Okay. So what are the cons? The cons are the data that they've published, and they've published a number of papers, do not support their diagnostic. And it's not that hard. So they basically say, we took a bunch of dogs with lymphoma and we measured their circulating nucleosomes. And we took a bunch of healthy dogs and we measured their nucleosomes and the dogs with lymphoma had no. But if you parse that out into what kind of lymphoma, or you ask the question, what kind of lymphoma, what stage, it turns out that they're very good at the late stages, they're not so good at the early stages, and they can't differentiate the lymphoma. And then, they said, we're going to do the same thing with hemangiosarcoma. And they said, well, with hemangiosarcoma, the data are a little bit dirtier, but the dogs with hemangiosarcoma have more. And therefore, we can tell you if your dog is at risk for lymphoma, and we can tell you if your dog is at risk for hemangiosarcoma. So we asked the question, like, what happens if you run the lymphoma data against the hemangiosarcoma data? And what happens if you run it against a bunch of unknowns? And the answer is, we haven't done that. We don't know. So if you get a, a positive, and, and the other thing is, how many of you have run this test? Okay, so your vet probably told you that you should bring your dog fasted. Because if you bring your dog and the dog is not fasted, you get what they call a false positive. So if you're running a cancer test, and if you have a meal before you run the test, it goes up. How does that tell you that there's cancer? And what if you forgot? Or what if your dog went out and ate the squirrel when you went out and <laughs> you didn't notice? So I, I think that, you know, again, it's, it's a phenomenal test, but, but I don't think that they really have done their homework about their diagnostic claims. Uh, and, and I'm saying this, 
I'm being recorded, right? This is going to be out in the open. I, I, this, this is what I believe. And uh, if, if they have data to say differently, I think that they have the responsibility to sue me, which they can. But they, they also have the responsibility to convince you of this. And I think that I know the people who run the company. I know the people who develop it. They're very good scientists. This is not about doing bad science. I think this is a little bit about marketing getting ahead of the science. So, um, why are the indications for the new field test? I have no idea. I, I can't think of it. Um, and what's the action ability of the new field test? I have no idea. So, it, it doesn't mean that I'm saying that veterinarians should offer it. I'm just saying that if you ask me, should I use it? The answer is no. And would I use it on my dog? The answer is no. But certainly your veterinarian or somebody else could convince you. So the other test that's on the market is pet DXS oncocaine. Pet DXS oncocaine is a little bit of a different story. And the pros are that reportedly, okay, and I, I want you to underline this word reportedly, it has high specificity to detect and differentiate pre-existing cancer. Um, and the company has built a really deep bench of clinicians and scientists with excellent knowledge and skill. So there's no doubt that the people that are working at PetDX are talking. And they know what they're doing. So when I say reportedly, the problem with um, PetDX is that we have no idea what they're measuring. We know they're measuring DNA in the circulation. That much we know. But we don't know what they're measuring in the DNA. So the methodology is undisclosed because it's a, it's a trade secret, essentially. But that means that I don't really know if whatever they're measuring really has anything to do with cancer. And, and, and so it makes it really hard for me to, to take the data at face value. Okay? But even if I do take the data at face value, what we know is that PEDDX on cocaine is really good at detecting big bulky cancers that I can see and that the surgeon can cut out or the oncologist can treat with chemo. And it's not nearly as good at detecting tiny little cancers. Although it can. It's just not nearly as good. Okay, so we have no information as to what is being measured. It's incredibly expensive, so those of you who have run it, you know, it's very expensive. Um, and then, what are the indications? And I think that the only indication is if we take the data from the company at face value, so we take all the other things that we know, good scientists, they know what they're doing, they, they have data basically saying when we run our test and it says positive, 97% of the time we find the tumor. Okay, so if we take all that at face value, I think that if you have a dog that has a suspected cancer, so there's clinical signs, there's some evidence that the dog has cancer, but you can't find it. This would be a great test to say you have to look harder. Okay? I think that would be the, the, the indication where oncocaine would be really good. Um, what's the action ability? So in the context where you say there's a cancer there and you have to look really hard to find it, and oncocaine says yes, then you go and you look really hard to find it. But otherwise, I don't really know what the action ability is. And so I've talked to people who say, you know, that the way that PX sells it is um, we, um, we, we had a case, so, that, so they give you a lot of case studies. We had a case, and, and, and the owner was a veterinary nurse, and she had a golden, and the, she ran the test, and it turned out that the test pointed out to the dog having hemangiosarcoma, and they couldn't find it. But they know the dog was going to get hemangiosarcoma, so they could pamper the dog for a year. And a year later, the dog developed an atrial hemangiosarcoma. They were able to let it go, and they already knew so it was easier for them. And that is the company. <coughs> for me, I go back to the previous story that I told you. Like, you're telling me that my healthy dog is what? And what am I going to do? And so, for some people, it might be really good to know. And for other people, you know, so, so Alzheimer's runs in my family, right? And they say, do you want to get tested? And I go, no, I don't, because I don't want to know, right? I, when I get it, I won't know anyway, so, <laughs> so I don't want to know, right? Uh, but, you know, but, but some of my cousins will say, yeah, I want to know, because maybe I'll go into a clinical trial, or maybe I'll eat more spinach, right? And that, that's cool. So, so, so I, again, you know, the, the point is, I am, I am giving you sort of the facts, and then I'm giving you my and these are the facts, and my opinion is that if somebody said, should I run PETDX as a screening test on my dog? I would say, I wouldn't do it because I don't know what you would do with the information. Um, but if somebody said, my dog 
looks like cancer, walks like cancer, walks like cancer, but I, we can't find it, I would say run the DX. And I, I said that to more than one person. And if pet DX comes back negative, then worry less. And if pet DX comes back positive, look hard. So you can. So that's what's out on the market. Most of the other tests that have been out on the market have already failed. Them. So how does the SOS test work and how is it different? So I'll tell you about how we do it and I'll tell you what we measure so that you know exactly how we're different. Um, so we um, ask the veterinarian or a veter uh, an animal health professional to take a blood sample. You don't want me doing that because my eyesight is terrible now and I couldn't get a bank account too, but our nurses are great, right? So whether the dog is, uh, the dog needs to be somewhere right now where that SOS sample can be transported to a lab within 48 hours, reliably. So as you can imagine living in Minnesota in the winter, I can get challenging because FedEx gets trapped in Memphis um, because they can't fly into Minneapolis because it's you know, minus 40. That's like usual for us. Um, um, and, and so in, in this test, we have not run samples from Hawaii and Alaska precisely because we, we have a high risk for the samples not getting to the 40 hours. We are, we are currently trying to understand if we can use some of the stabilization uh, tubes that are out there, and that might give us a seven day window, which would be a little more expensive. So we get the blood sample, and the first thing that we do is we put it in a solution that makes the red cells explode and the platelets disappear. And this is not really magic, it's just basically chemistry and physics. It's pretty simple. And then we're left with all the white blood cells. Um, but in and among the white blood cells are a bunch of other cells that are really the ones we have. So we use antibodies. And the antibodies have uh, cute little fluorescent bags that look like the Christmas light. And we add these antibodies to the cells. And then we run them to a, through a flow cytometry. And we get, we get all the data from the flow cytometer. And so um, normally what we do is we run one million cells on the test. And for every one of those million cells right now, we're collecting 33 data points. So we end up with 33 million data points. Okay. And I look pretty smart. I cannot parse out 33 million data. So we use something that's called artificial intelligence or machine learning. And computers are really smart, but you have to train them. So we've created a training set, and the machine learning is what gives us our output. And, and I don't have a lot of details about machine learning, but if you want to uh, ask me more questions, I can tell you a lot about how we do So the way that we decide that we design the, the process, um, Shine on One was essentially designed to develop the machine learning. We collected a lot of known samples, and we fed them to the, to the machine learning algorithms, and we said, here, this is what normal looks like, and this is what commandless sarcoma looks like, and, and so on, right? So that when it recognized the pattern, it could say, oh, it looks most like this one. Um, so um, SOS version one, which is what we're running right now in our experiment, had more than 90% specificity, that means that it accurately assigned the patient to the cancer group, and, and better than 50% sensitivity. So it was there, it found you know, diagnosed cancer 50% of the time, uh, or better when it was present. Now, we're working on SOS version two, and we just asked the Department of Defense for uh, about a million and a half dollars to work on SOS two in dogs and try to translate that to humans. And our, our early data tell us that um, SOS version 2 will probably have better than 95% specificity, so now we're uh, on par with what FedDX claims that they can do, and we are um, about 85% sensitivity, which is um, much better than what other people claim. So we're pretty excited at these numbers. Um, cool. um, but, but our training set for SOS 2 is too small for us to have confidence, so we're using SOS 1 still. Okay. So, how do we know if it works? So we did our training, and then the first validation was a tiny little um, experiment where we had 11 dogs that had hemangiosarcoma sarcoma that came through one of our clinical trials. And so we knew that these dogs had hemangiosarcoma sarcoma because we cut the tumor out, and we put it under the microscope, and we said, yes, we know it's hemangiosarcoma. sarcoma. And the dogs went through a clinical trial, and we know it. So there was 11 dogs. We took the blood sample before they had, before they had any treatment, and they went out to get their treatment. Okay. So, 11 dogs with the sarcoma. We have four groups. And so, our training set includes a group of dogs with the sarcoma, a group of healthy dogs, 
a group of dogs with some cancer that is not in the sarcoma that we know exactly what it is. Dogs that had splenic hematomas or other lumps and bumps in the spleen that are not cancer. Um, and then these are um, unstained cells out of the full cytometry, so it basically means the algorithm should say, I have no idea what this is. Okay? And, and what I'm showing you here is one machine learning algorithm, but basically I could show you any one of the 11. Um, and there's four axes. So each axis represents one of these conditions that we train, and the distance from zero is the accuracy of that system. And so you can see that all the blue dots here are in the circle now, and all the green dots here are the cancer, and all the orange or brown dots here are the um, monolithic and splenic lesions. And these are all the healthy young dogs that we tested. And these are all the unstained cells from all the samples of the, the machine learning says, I don't know what these guys are because they don't look like anything. So it works pretty well. Um, and so out of the 11 dogs with hematous sarcoma, eight of them fall in hematous sarcoma. And I think it's, it's important for you to know that they move as far out. So the level of certainty is pretty good. The algorithm is telling us that it'll say, these guys are hematous sarcoma. Okay. Um, it takes two more. And it says, I don't think they're hemendous sarcoma. They look like another cancer, right? So is it because these guys here are the androgenic and these guys are the adipogenic? We don't know. Is it because of the stage of development? It's, it's not whether it was in the spleen or the heart or something. It has nothing to do with it. But, you know, even if they were here, we are still pretty confident because it's cancer. And then we have one that you can see buried back here. And so this guy uh, looked like a splenic hematoma. And we know that there's one cell type of hemangiosarcoma sarcoma that we call inflammatory. That we, we have a really hard time separating it from, what, from the splenic hematomas, except for the fact that half of the dogs with inflammatory hemangiosarcoma sarcoma are going to die with it. Half of them live, and they live a pretty long time. But the other half are going to die with it. So, so in some cases, it looks like it. So this is not surprising. But the interesting thing is that none of them look like healthy, right? So this is this is kind of a win. We we are pretty confident that our training looks good. So the next thing that we that we do is we are going to say what does it measure and how good is it in the setting of no magnitude. So it turns out that our test measures this screen. This aging line is what we're measuring. So how do we know that? Well the green line includes all of these other components of the tumor environment <coughs> that may or may not include the tumor cells. Okay. Um, and so what we actually measure are patterns of stem cells and mesenchymal cells. Mesenchymal cells are the guys that make up the glue of the body. So uh, blood vessels, muscle, fat, uh, cartilage, bone, uh, fibroblasts that make collagen, those are all mesenchymal cells. And it turns out that there are small numbers, tiny, tiny little numbers of those cells running around, and there's tiny little numbers of stem cells running around, and they create patterns. And the machine learning is actually visualizing that pattern and saying this pattern looks like a young, healthy, fit dog. This pattern looks like a hematosarcoma. This pattern looks like other cancer or splenic. Um, it turned out that, that uh, we thought we were really smart, and we're not that smart, and machine learning taught us something. So the parents were producing artificial intelligence, and Rhonda reminded me that if I said AI, it would mean something totally different. <laughs> and, and this is really important. The cells that create these patterns are actually getting mobilized. So, so these are the construction workers going from their house to the subdivision, to build the, to plot out the lots and put in the you know foundation for the school and the church and stuff, and and if you catch them going between eight or between six in the morning and nine in the morning at rush hour, you have a better chance of finding them because that's what they're there, right? And then you catch them going home, so they're not always there. So we do run into a known issue of lower limit of detection and sensitivity. We are looking for events that that um, constitute less than 0.1 percent of the population of cells that have nuclei, so white blood cells and other cells with nuclei, in the blood. Which means that um, when we run one million cells, we're actually creating patterns from 0.01 to 0.1% of the cells. And, and 
if you think of this statistically, our limit of detection is about, uh, stretching it really hard, it's about 1 in 200,000 to 1 in 300,000. So we need, um, we need three cells to be present. And we probably need many more than three cells to create a pattern. So, um, so, so we do have uh, our work cut out for us in, in terms of, of increasing the limit of detection of the assay to improve our sensitivity and our specificity. Um, so again, just like construction workers or the henchmen, the, the, the henchmen that do the this dirty work, the cells may only be around for a little bit. Uh, the, the limit of detection is a challenge, um, but still we decided um, after we had spent about 18 to 20 months doing this stuff, we said, okay, we're ready to, to start Shine on 3, and that was where we decided we were going to take dogs six years or older. Remember, we, we chose six because four is the, the upper limit of young and healthy, and we didn't know what to do with four to six, so we said, we're just going to use six as our, as our early part. The dogs have to be six or older. Um, and can we actually the earliest detection? Can we take these healthy dogs that the veterinarian says, yes, they're healthy, they don't have a tumor, um, take their blood and say, can we find if they are um, going to develop a tumor or maybe have a tumor? Um, so the eligibility was AKC registered Goldens, Cordies, and Boxers. And you know why we did this? Because it's all the paid bills. <laughs> um, the dogs had to be in good health. Um, there had to be no evidence of cancer, chronic disease, other serious conditions. At the end of the day, um, we are going to end up having to toss out data from about um, 19 dogs where the owners, oopsie, forgot to tell us that a year ago the dog had had a tumor. But it's, it's okay, it doesn't change. Um, dogs have to be six years old or older, and we actually enrolled 109 dogs. So our goal was 100, we enrolled 109. Um, the data that I'm going to show you excludes um, Nine, nine of them, so there's about 200, but um, our final data is it's going to be about 180 or something. And then we're following these dogs for life. We still have dogs that are alive. We're still working on them. So um, this is a really fun story. We opened on January 2nd of 2018, if I remember correctly. And so we put a web page together, and the people would come to this web page, and there was a button at the bottom that said, I want to enroll. And they would fill out the form, and then we would check their eligibility and using a system that's called REDCap. And and we had no, we've never done this before, right? So we had no clue what the response was going to be. So the page was actually written on December 22nd, and it was stored in the background, hidden from the world, in the University of Minnesota server. When we came in at eight in the morning to do the release, twelve people had signed up. So I asked you, they must have been like 14 years. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, so we opened at, at 8 in the morning. There was a Facebook blast from uh, the Minnesota Vet School, from GRCA, uh, maybe also from GRF, I don't remember, from Portuguese Water Dogs and from Boxers. So by 5 o'clock that evening, remember we have 200 slots, right? By 5 o'clock that evening, we have 750 requests. Oh. By 11 o'clock the next morning, we had over a thousand. Yeah. It's like, now we have to tell 800 people that they can't come in, right? And we have to uh, tell people that enroll on day one that they're not going to be able to get in for 10 months because we, you know, we can only process so many samples at one time. Um, so uh, fortunately with COVID, it hasn't been it's been much more manageable, but um, it won't surprise you to know that we have six breeds and an open group for, for uh, COVID. So, um, for, and we decided to batch them into two week periods and to randomize. So we said, if you come in at day one or at day 14, your chances of getting in are the same because of day 14 we're gonna randomize. So by day 14, we had 183 gold deaths. And for some of the other breeds, we so, so, so it, there is a difference in this community. You guys are pretty amazing. But it, you also make our life hard because you have to go back and tell people you know that you're going to do. So, so this is kind of a fun story. 
Um, so at the end of the day, what was our breed distribution? We aimed for two goldens for every 40 and every boxer. That was by design. Because the golden community paid for half, and the boxers in the 40s paid for a quarter. So um, it turns out that you guys paid for one extra Portuguese one. <laughs> Okay, so this is, this is a little bit complicated, so I'm going to walk you through it. These are data from the three year from enrollment. So every dog, for every dog, we set a, a timeline, right? And this is when all of the dogs have reached three years from enrollment. So it's, it's a little bit um, back from now, but you'll see why it doesn't really matter. Why this, these data are about as good as anything. So the green line, this, this is basically all of the dogs to mine, and then this is three. It's goldens, porties, bucks. And the green line is what we call NDD, no disease detectable. So these are dogs that are still healthy and they can be of any age. So the youngest ones are going to be nine, because they enrolled at six and now they're nine. And the oldest ones are going to be like 14 or so. Okay? And we do have a fair amount of older ones. And so um, if you look, the green line for goldens is about 60%. But so about 60, you know, out of 100 goldens, about 60 are still healthy. Um, the green line for 40s is about 60%, so, you know, whatever 60% of 26 is, or whatever 60% of 51 is. Um, but the boxers are not as healthy. So, I don't really know what it means, because it's not that many dogs, but, the, you know, the boxers are, are coming out and they're dropping out soon. And it's not purely an age. Um, the other thing that you can see is that um, the red line is a diagnosis of hemangiosarcoma, and the yellow line is a diagnosis of other cancer. And I do have to caution you that most of our diagnoses have a level of evidence of one or two, where one is we actually have a tumor and we looked at it under the microscope, and a board certified pathologist said, this is what it is. A, le a level of evidence, too, is that we have uh, a lot of really good laboratory data, including, for example, psychology, but we don't have a bio. A level of evidence three is that the veterinarian did radiographs and imaging, and they're pretty sure, but 